the topic of mineralogy in our online textbook. This is chapter three, but this is a continuation from before. What I want to talk to you about today is the identification of minerals using various physical and optical properties. So we're going to just say ID by properties. And when I identify a mineral, I'm going to be using one of these seven or eight different properties. Or actually, I'll probably be using three or four of them in conjunction. The first of the properties that I would like to introduce to you is the one that we always first see, and it is color. It's a great first step, and we're actually going to write this down. It's a great first step. You can't avoid color. But for some minerals, color can be very deceitful because they can occur in any color of the rainbow. Whereas for other uh, minerals, it's diagnostic, and as soon as you see that green color, you know, boom, what mineral it is. The other thing I do want to emphasize when, when it, with respect to color is that uh, we're not, we don't all see color the same. Some of us see more color than others. Some are colorblind. 4% of men, for example, are colorblind. So they need to look past color at other properties in order to uh, correctly identify minerals. The next thing I do want to point out about color is that this is based on the absorption of light. So it's how a mineral absorbs versus transmits light. And the light that we see is the color that is not absorbed. So we are going to be seeing the transmission color. And this is going to be controlled mostly by ions. Oh boy, let's spell that right. Ions or structure. These are the two things inside of a mineral that can lead to the color or the difference of color. For example, this is corundum, which can either be red, ruby, or blue sapphire, but it can actually be a lot of other colors too, depending on if the chromophore, which is an ion, is chrome or titanium or magnesium or iron. Chromium, for example, would be giving us this beautiful red color. All right, the next property that I would like to introduce to you is streak. Now streak is also color, but it's the color of the powdered mineral. It's so okay, it's the color of powdered mineral. And when you powder a mineral to a very fine powder, you actually get rid of a lot of that structural information. And so you can perceive a different color than what you can than what you see when something is full and in, in bulk. The best example for streak is this example of hematite. Hematite is deceptive at, at body color. It's usually a reddish brown color like this example here. But there is a variety of hematite called specular hematite, and that's a silver color. But when you scratch it on what's called a streak plate, which is this thing right here that I'm boxing out, which is a, uh, it's a piece of um, porcelain or something that you powder it on, both the specular and the normal hematite show this diagnostic red-brown color. Uh -huh. so that's a streak plate. And you're going to be given one of these streak plates in lab or in future classes. Now number three in this list is luster. And luster is the appearance, the, uh, the external appearance from reflected light. How can we say that? Let's say surface appearance, appearance um, of reflected light. It's not the light that passes through. It's not the light that gets absorbed. It's what bounces off the surface of that mineral. And there's going to be two big names under this. You can have a luster that is metallic. And that's, it looks like a metal. You don't need any more vocab than that. There's another group for luster that is described as non-metallic. And non-metallic holds a lot of different adjectives. I'm going to say or more adjectives to describe how that surface looks. And in, for the purpose of this class, this introductory class, I do not actually want you to even bother learning these adjectives. For me, I'm happy if you can say this mineral has a metallic luster or a non-metallic luster as we distinguish categories for minerals. Number four is hardness. Hardness means resistance to scratching. 
scratching. Underline scratching, because it is not breaking. That is a different uh, descriptor entirely. Hardness is the resistance to scratching. It is done on a relative scale. And so when we in mineralogy do hardness tests, we will take a mineral and we will try to scratch it with another mineral and decide if it is stronger or not. So in this picture right here, we have a fingernail that is putting a scratch on this mineral. That mineral must be very soft because fingernails have a low softness. And in fact, we say it has a hardness of two and a half on this scale. And again, I'm not gonna make you memorize this. It's called Mohs Hardness Scale. And Mohs Hardness Scale is a relative scale of all minerals ranging from one, which is talc. Uh, spell that right, T-A. And that's baby powder material, all the way up to number 10, which is diamond. And so what we can do is we can categorize and bin minerals based on if they are harder or softer than something. So for example, quartz is a seven, and so we can't scratch quartz with our fingernail because fingernail is a 2.5, but gypsum is a two. And so if you've got a clear mineral provided to you, well, both quartz and gypsum could be clear, but if it scratches with your fingernail, then we know it's gypsum, all right? That is our Mohs hardness scale and the, top, and, and the idea of, of hardness and scratching. Okay, number five is, has to do with, whoop, number five has to do with weight and density, and it's called specific gravity. The word I want you to associate with specific gravity is heaviness. And we're gonna write this down as a quote. It's the feeling of heaviness. In our day-to-day -day life, we know when something kind of feels the way it's supposed to. If you pick up your backpack and you can barely pick it up, whoa, that's got a lot more books than normal. That has a high feeling of heaviness. And we do this based on our expectation. And, and this unit is like density, but it's unitless. And let me show you what I mean by it's like density, but unitless. So here's an example. G is our symbol for specific gravity. And we have, we're gonna do it. So the way the formula works is it's a mineral density divided by water density. This is the equation for how you calculate specific gravity. And so for an example, let's do uh, gold. So gold has a, has a mineral density of 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed divided by one gram per centimeter cubed because that's the density of water. And that is 19 divided by one, units cancel. The number, the specific gravity for gold is 19.3. The feeling of heaviness of gold is really high, and our arbiter for that tends to be 2.7. A G of 2.7 equals normal because the most basic rocks that we tend to interact with, limestones and sandstones and granites, they have a specific gravity around 2.7. So something with lead in it or metal is gonna be higher and it's gonna feel like it has a high specific gravity. A pumice with a lot of air trapped inside would have a low specific gravity. All right, number six is crystal habit. We're almost done with our list today. Crystal habit. This is our outward form of faces or the external appearance of our crystal. Outward form, maybe let's say defined by faces. And there's two different possibilities for crystal habit. You can have something with really good crystal faces, maybe it even belongs in a museum. We call those euhedral, eu means good. So this would be good faces. And anhedral, this means lax faces. Nobody wants to collect rocks or minerals that are anhedral. There's a lot of different uh, other descriptor terms under euhedral versus anhedral. I'll just draw like, so here's an example of a cube. There are some minerals that form as a cube diagnostically. Halite or fluorite would be great examples. Maybe we had a quartz crystal and a quartz crystal grows as, as some hexagonal prism with a point on top. That would be a diagnostic example of a euhedral crystal habit. All right, number seven. What do we have next? 
it's going to be breaking. Minerals grow in certain ways and minerals also break in certain ways. And within breaking, um, this, this is a phenomenon that's controlled by bonding and structure. Bonding plus structure. And the simplest kind of breaking is just called fracture. And fracture is irregular. And, and this occurs when the bonding is the same in all directions. The bond strength is equal in X, Y, and Z, then you're most likely going to have fracture, an irregular breaking. But when bond strength is not the same in all directions, you can actually have, have directions of preferential weakness, directions of weak bonding. And that produces a, a type of breaking that we call cleavage. And, and this is really neat. It, it's a, we're gonna say this, it's breaking along planes of weak bonding. Breaking along planes of weak bonding. I bet you've seen it before, although you might not necessarily recognize it. Uh, you've heard of the mineral mica. Well, mica minerals have a plane of weak bonding that allows it to break off in sh thin sheets. Calcite is a really neat example where we can have a large chunk of calcite and it'll have this form. Let's write this, mica. Calcite's our most famous example. And if we were to hit that calcite with a hammer, it would actually break into little pieces that look exactly the same outwardly because that shape is defined by a rhombohedral weakness at the atomic level. I guess I, I should probably put in a real picture of this now since you've dealt with my sketches. But here is a garnet crystal. That garnet has broken with fracture. The, the garnet's the same strength in all directions, and we just get an irregular breaking, where this mica has a plane of weak van der Waals bonds that allows it to break off in these sheets. All right, and then number eight, the last characteristic that I want you to know is gonna be like assorted or other. Some minerals have properties that are just unusual to themselves and fairly unique. For example, some minerals are magnetic. That makes them really easy to identify. Some react with HCl. That's hydrochloric acid. And in fact, calcite is the one that does that. You, and that'll help you identify it in lab or future classes. And then other minerals react with light differently and they could be fluorescent. All right, those are the tools for mineral identification. Good luck.